Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History of Value podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Berman. Today, Dr. David Litwa joins me, and we're going to be talking about what is the best evidence for the historical Jesus? This is kind of uh, similar. Uh, so some of these questions are similar to uh, the things I asked uh, Professor Bart Ehrman uh, when I first interviewed him. Um, that was uh, in, the late, in late last year. Okay, so that takes me to this first question I have for you. What is the best evidence that scholars use to determine that Jesus Christ existed? Well, it's a great question, but in a sense, it's a, it's a little bit of an odd question. You know, when classicists and other historians of the ancient world, when they want to study other figures such as Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus or Herod the Great, or even Apollonius of Tiana, they don't usually start with the question, did this figure exist? Right. Um, yeah. And the reason for that, I, I think it, it, there's probably many reasons for that, but um, the existence of Jesus is highly politicized, and it has to do with larger questions about the legitimacy of Christianity as a religion. And I must lay my cards down right up front here and say that the way that I think about it, and I've laid this out in my book, How the Gospels Became History, is I don't, I don't see or I don't vouch for a real sharp connection between the truth of a religion and the historicity, or the truth of Christianity and the historicity of Jesus. I think uh, actually whether or not you're a minimal historicist or a mythicist, it really doesn't make too much of a difference. And even if you could prove sort of absolutely that Jesus didn't exist, I don't think it would make much of an impact on Christianity or even Christian truth. So I'm just laying down my cards there because I, I don't want to get caught up too much in the politics of all of this. Um, there are apologists on both sides with their, you know, artillery armed and ready, sort of <laughs> like Russia now on the, you know, the border of Ukraine. And they want to prove either that Christianity is true because it's historical or that Christianity is false because it's not historical. And what I question is this connection between historicity and truth. I don't see it. I think that's a particular Western connection that may or may not be philosophically legitimate, and we would need to bring in philosophers and uh, to, to and, and philosophers of, of of history to really talk about that. Um, but to to get to your question, in in all fairness, I I think there's there's a lot of good evidence for the existence of a physical man. Um, Jesus, and uh, where I where are you you could start with external evidence, or you could start with internal evidence, and and I'll just start with sort of evidence internal to Christianity. So you have Paul, and Paul, uh, Paul probably never saw the the physical Jesus. I mean, actually, we don't actually fully know that. I mean. He, might have conceivably, we don't actually know, but he 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 makes no claim to, to doing that. But Paul does say um, some important things in Galatians, which is one of his earlier letters. He says, first of all, that Jesus was born of a woman. And if you're born of a woman, then that's a pretty good indication that you are a physical human being and that Paul did consider Jesus to be a physical human being. In Romans, the introduction, he says that Jesus was of the seed of David, and that would indicate that he is in the physical genealogy and is in the bloodline of the Davidic king. And so whether or not you actually believe that is, is irrelevant here. The point is that Paul considered Jesus to be in the a flesh and blood character in the bloodline of another real human being. The other thing to point out is that Paul knew uh, Peter, James, and John, whom he calls pillars in the letter to Galatians. And uh, the question here is, so 
why are these guys pillars? And, and why does Paul seem to be in conflict with them? Well, that's a long story, but the short, the shortcut answer is they were pillars because they were eyewitnesses of the physical Jesus. And in fact, James, um, Paul doesn't say this directly, so, but uh, it's, it's widely known that James uh, claimed to be the brother of Jesus physically. Okay, so that's not just some kind of fictive kinship relationship. So Paul has been in and out of Jerusalem. Paul, Paul knows these people who have been in physical interaction with Jesus, and they are the pillars, which means that they are leading the Jerusalem church, and Paul comes into James and his party, who uh, have a, a different view of, of following Christians following Jewish rituals and the necessity for that. Not going to get into that, but basically, there's important evidence. Um, Paul also, despite what he says in Galatians, Paul also has been in and out of Jerusalem, and, and he knows very well that he's picked up traditions from these people who knew Jesus as a physical person, okay? And he reveals this in 1 Corinthians 15 and says that, you know, I'm, I'm handing on to you what was delivered to me, okay? Delivered to me by other people. And then he goes on and says that there were people including James, including Peter, including 500 people at one time who saw Jesus as risen from the dead. Now, Paul doesn't claim to get this revelation from heaven, okay? He's getting this from people, the people themselves who saw Jesus, okay? Now, it's often said by mythicists that, the, that, that these were all visions um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and I, I I honestly have to say that I that strikes me as is not an is is a, a statement based on assumptions, and the fact is these uh, these aren't called visions of the the resurrected Jesus. It is simply the Greek word is simply ophthi that Jesus appeared to these people. It literally, was seen by these people. It can also be translated simply was seen. Jesus was seen by. Cephas, he was seen by Peter, he was seen by 500 brothers at the same time. Now, I know that uh, other people are more, uh, in terms of psychology, are, are, have much more knowledge, and I'm not a psychologist, but if, if, if Paul, and we have to take him at his word here, we don't have to believe him, but we have to believe that he believed what he was saying, and if he believed that 500 people saw Jesus risen from the dead, then I would put my money on that not being a dream because 500 people don't separately dream Jesus. Even two or three people don't separately dream Jesus. And we have to, to my, my money is on that this is a, a vision in, if you want to call it a vision, fine, but it's, it's something that they're experiencing in the waking state. Okay. So, but I, I should just confess humility here and say that we don't exactly know what 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 these are. But I, I think it's false to say that these are just sort of dreams or things that early Christians experienced in, in trance states, and then they they historicized and so on and so forth. There's also details in the gospel literature which um, aren't explained by other other parallels. So, for instance. <clears throat> It's often said by mythicists who are rampant by Mises critics that anything in the Gospels can be reconstructed from everything else. You know, uh, that is, if you have all of world mythology laid open at your feet, you can pick and choose and reconstruct the life of Jesus from, say, Osiris or Inanna or uh, Baal or, or any other any other myths. You know, regardless of how far flung. I mean, they might even pick from Aboriginal and Indonesian myth. I mean, who, who knows? I mean, the world is your oyster. Now, technically, this is true for any story, right? Because it's like saying, it's like the equivalent of saying, well, no story is absolutely original, right? So even if, even if I have a, a story and an African creation myth, well, if I have all of world mythology open, as a parallel, I can start picking out parallels, even for something as crazy like, you know, uh, a, 
a, the world is made, you know, from a turtle shell that rose from the primeval ocean, and there was an egg on top of the shell, and a snake came out of the egg and and circled the earth. And you know, I mean, it could be something crazy. It could be anything, really. And and I could find parallels to that in other world world mythology. The way that the Jesus story is told is that this, the synoptic narratives are taken and written. I, to my mind, very clearly as historia. And historia is an ancient genre for telling events that really happened, okay, that, that the author believes really happened. And I have no doubt in my mind that whoever wrote these stories believed that the contents are what really happened. Now, there's really nothing, or at least to me, nothing convincing in world mythology that would demand that you know, that, that these gospel writers are pulling from that would demand that Jesus be born or that Jesus be of, of Galilean heritage, okay? So there's a bit of a local color in the story that Jesus is a man from Galilee. Now, nothing really, nothing really compelled the synoptic writers to say, or, or John, to, to say that he was from Galilee. I mean, he could have been from someplace that was much more important um, so to my mind, th that local color element that he's, that specific places in Galilee are mentioned, is it, is it like Capernaum and, and Nazareth and so on and, forth, so on and so forth? That's a great indication of someone who at least thinks that they're writing history and adding in very specific historical details. Now, it's very easy for mythicists to pick off, you know, to, to focus on sort of the, the front and the back end of the Gospels, which are the birth narratives, which are the most highly mythicized, okay, and the, the post-resurrection stories, which are also the, the bits that are most highly mythicized. And so those are the easy bits to sort of say, well, you know, we can reconstruct the birth narratives out of, you know, Exodus and the Moses and and throw in, you know, a bunch of, you know, Cyrus and, and, and a bunch of others, and, and we can reconstruct the gospel birth narratives. Uh, that's fine. But in terms of the basic, in terms of the basic narrative of Jesus as, as a man, a peasant born in Galilee, who is crucified under a definite and known procurator, Pontius Pilate, for whom we have independent attestation. And um, I mean, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing certainly in world mythology or in Jewish mythology that would demand that he be uh, uh, crucified under Pilate, okay? And I know that they want to disturb things and say, well, you know, the, they are, uh, their disagreements, some, some that the Talmud says he was crucified under Alexander Janias and so on and so forth. Um, that's, the Talmud is the Talmud. The Talmud is, is incredibly historically inaccurate in most of its details and has, has re refers also to Jesus as, as Ben Pantera and, and seems to view him in a variety of different ways, just as the gospel writers assume, a sort of like as a magician. So if you want to pick like one story from the Talmud, which doesn't have any claim to historical accuracy whatsoever, and then pretend that it's a you know, first century Christian tradition from a distinct sect of Christians who actually thought that he was, you know, under Alexander Janias, that's just not good scholarship at all. Um, the overwhelming attestation is Pontius Pilate, and really, there's not much doubt about that at all whatsoever. So then you can also look at uh, external attestation and uh, so sometimes people point to the expulsion of the Jews under Claudius, and uh, it's Suetonius who informs us about this in, in chapter 25 of the book, uh, the life of his life of Claudius, a part of his life of the Caesars, and uh, basically the text says that Claudius expelled the Jews impulsari Christo, that is at the instigation of Christus. And um, the scholars will disagree on this, but I think that Christus is uh, Christ. I think that this is internal Jewish rioting over Christians who have come and missionized the Jews and there's turbulence and the Jews can't disagree about the messianic status of Christ. And so Claudius just takes care of the problem by expelling uh, these 
these two different parties of Jews who are just causing a lot of trouble. Okay, so that's an indication to me that Christians are in the capital, the imperial capital around the year, uh, say 45 to, to 50. And that's, as we would expect, Paul writes the letter to Romans just a, a couple years later. And uh, so that's, there's that. And then you also have, um, you also have the fact that the Romans become very aware of Christians in 64. And in fact, uh, that's the year of the, the fire at Rome. And that's when Nero specifically targets Christians. And uh, we, we, we have this not from a Christian writer, but from, from Tacitus. So the, uh, the Roman government is, very, is, is now, by 64, able to distinguish a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a devotee of Jesus, from other Jews in established synagogues, and they're able to hunt them down and basically uh, burn them alive. And uh, again, I think this is important because uh, it, it indicates that this was a, a very, this was a distinguished sect of people and they had to have at this point a identifying story to match their identity and that identity had had something to do with christ and what disgusted the romans as tacitus reveals is that they worshiped a criminal crucified by the roman state so they just look like first of all like mindless idiots uh and and riffraff who could be blamed and scapegoated. And I, I think that's I think that's important because what I think what what bugs Rome and the Roman government is that particular narrative of of the crucifixion, that you are worshiping a man who was executed, and Tacitus says, agreeing with the gospels that he's executed in the time of Tiberius under under Pontius Pilate. So you've got that external attestation. Um, then you've got the testimony in Flavianum, um, and uh, this has been obviously very sharply debated, and I'm just going to lay down my cards that I follow mainstream scholarship here in that the, the testimonium in Book 18 is an interpolated passage, but that there was a core uh, and in which Josephus did let his readers know about the existence of Jesus, who was called Christ. And then he goes on when in book 20, when he deals with the death of James, to refer to Jesus, who was called Christ, as a kind of a back reference to this passage in book 18. Now, there's endless debate about this, and, and everyone, you know, should should read up on this. And, and uh, but but I think even if you even if you reject the the testimonium Flavianum itself in in chapter eighteen um, or sorry book eighteen you you can't so easily uh, get rid of uh, the reference to Jesus in in book twenty. I think it's perfectly plausible that a, a man as smart as Josephus would have known about Jesus. Okay, if he knew about James, he would have known about. Jesus, okay, that, that that doesn't surprise me at all, okay, because we know Josephus is in Rome in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and he, he knows and has to know that Christians are a distinct sect in Rome, and just as every other Roman knew since the Nero, the persecution under Nero, okay, and so it, it is actually historically important enough for Josephus to mention the founder figure. And that doesn't seem implausible to me what, at all, whatsoever, okay? Now, do, I, I mean, he doesn't want to accentuate the importance of Jesus, and really no, no Roman or Greek writer wants to accentuate the importance of Jesus. At this point, Jesus isn't a household name, but he's important enough, I think, to mention. And when Josephus gets to James, this is another time where Jesus is mentioned, and he's he's mentioned his claim to fame is that he's a so-called Christ, and uh, that's very that's very distinctive. 
and, and it goes all the way back to Impulso e Cristo, that the Romans know this individual not as Jesus, not as Jesus, but as by his sort of common Christian nickname, as it were, Christ. So he is Hologam Manos Christos, the so-called Christ, as Josephus uh, mentions. And I, I think uh, the problem here with mythicists is, and one of the reasons that concern me about the mythicist camp is that when they get evidence that uh, contradicts them, they tend to want to erase it from history. And so uh, that's a definite sign of uh, deductive scholarship rather than inductive scholarship. Um, scholarship, whatever it is, ought to be able to be proved wrong. And, and, and you, you cannot simply eliminate data by a theory of interpolation, especially when there is, especially in the case of book 20 of, of, of Josephus's Antiquities, absolutely zero uh, manuscript evidence for an interpolation, okay? And when we get to the Ascension of Isaiah, we'll see this very same technique that, but when you have, evidence against you, instead of facing it straight on, the mythicist will just try to delete it from, from history as data. And that's definitely a red flag indicating that here we're not dealing with scholarship, we're dealing with a position that says, I've, got, I've taken my stand on this particular position, that Jesus doesn't exist and come hell or hell water, I will hold on to it. And data that is against my position, I will find a way to delete. That's a great sign that we're not dealing with true, honest scholarship that can be corrected. Now, there's actually a number of great books uh, that are out there. Um, you want to avoid the apologetics, obviously. But if you can get a good scholarly peer-reviewed book, on uh, you know evidence for the existence of, of Jesus, and and you know please I mean go beyond Bart Ehrman who's who's writing mostly popular books. If you're really uh, wanting to sink your teeth into this, go go to a real uh, research library, dig a little bit deeper, and uh, and 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 really learn what uh, what the the scholars are are saying. Um, but I think I, I, I think that's probably I've spent like 25 minutes on that question. So I think I'll I'll let you ask another one. <laughs> oh no, I thought I thought it was great. Um, and that really I think that this this question perfectly follows up on that. Why do scholars find mythicism to be fringe and categorize it as a pseudo historical conclusion? Well. I mean, not all of it, uh, not, not everybody would, would do that. Um, I mean, I think any position ought to be taken seriously, okay? No yeah. position, no position just can simply be di dismissed dogmatically. But what scholarship is, let's just talk about method here. What scholarship is, is it's trying to be non-dogmatic. Now, a dogmatic position is a position where you take a stand on an issue saying, you know, Christianity is true, and I'm going to find evidence of this position, okay? Or another dogmatic position, Jesus doesn't exist, and come hell or high water, I'm going to find evidence for him not existing, okay? <laughs> and when data comes into your purview that contradicts your dogmatic position, instead of dealing with that data head on, and revising your position, you twist that data or mold it or erase it or somehow skirt around it so that you can maintain your dogmatic position, okay? Right. That is dogmatism, okay? And it's everywhere, okay? It's everywhere. And, and, and it really appeals to human nature because sometimes our positions give us power, you know? And, and we just, we, we don't wanna change. And they give us a sense of identity, you know. And when you become defenders 
a defender of your dogmatic position, you become an apologist. An apologist is just another word for a defender. And there are apologists on both ends, okay? There's people, there's 2.3 billion Christians out there. Trust me, there's a lot of apologists who want to prove that Christianity is true and nothing in the world could could actually make them revise their position, <laughs> okay? So that's not scholarship. And there's lots of books, you know, that are that are written in that vein, okay? And then on, on the other side, you know, unfortunately we're quite polarized, but on the, on the other side, there's the, you know, the God doesn't exist and Jesus doesn't exist and nothing in the world would convince you otherwise and you're defending that position militantly. Okay, scholarship is somewhere in the middle. Scholarship works inductively and scholarship whatever scholarship doesn't uh propose dogmas it proposes hypotheses and every hypothesis can be disproved by data that everyone accepts okay and when you join the campus of scholarship you automatically put on the table say i'm going to be giving hypotheses i'm going to be testing hypotheses and I can be proved wrong. And when I receive data that proves me wrong, I will change my position. Okay, that's that's what scholarship does. Okay, so it, it doesn't matter who you are or 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 what you're trying to 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 learn about. You've got two ways of going about it. Either you can let the data control your conclusions which is an inductive method, or you can use the deductive and dogmatic method where you, you come to a dogmatic conclusion and you twist or erase or somehow skirt around the data. And that is, or can be called, pseudo-scholarship. And unfortunately, on both sides, okay, on mythicists and historicists, there is pseudo scholarship and your viewers should be on alert and watch out for it. Every position has to be hypothetical because none of us actually know or have access to you know, the final truth, okay? And anyone who claims that they have some dogmatic truth that they can absolutely prove and not change their position is not doing scholarship. So I think, yes, there are some mythicists who are like that and probably many more historicists. And the point is to be somewhere in the middle. Would you regard the ascension of Isaiah um, as, a, like, as evidence for mythicism because mythicists claim that it is? Um, but I know that there's been studies on that that show that it actually isn't. So could you talk about that? Definitely. And I would say the martyrdom and ascension of Isaiah is definitely not evidence of mythicism. Okay, that, that's my hypothesis here. And I'm going to try to give you the evidence for that. Okay. Um, the martyrdom and ascension of Isaiah, there's a lot of misinformation out there. But this is a fairly easy accessible text and uh, I'll just kind of help your, your viewers know the resources. So um, James Charlesworth, whom I know you've had on the show, yep. has this two volume set on the Old Testament pseudepigrapha and that's easily accessible. I highly recommend that. It it's, was in the mid eighties, but it's still a really useful resource. And that's got, uh, a nice full introduction to the Ascension of Isaiah uh, by Michael A. Uh, Knib. And so go check that out. There's also, uh, since 1995, there's been a wonderful critical edition by uh, Enrico Norelli. And he's an Italian scholar um, and, and, and did a, an amazing critical edition by which I mean that he, he's gone through all the manuscripts that we have and check for errors and try to give us a text that is the most reliable text. And he's also given us a commentary 
Unfortunately, it's in Italian, but um, it's well worth learning Italian. <laughs> okay. Um, now, what's interesting is when I look at mythicists, they don't really even cite Norelli, and and it's it's quite it's quite sad that they're they're actually not really up on on the scholarship. Uh, there's also claims that the ascension of Isaiah is is early, sort of sort of early of uh, contemporaneous with the synoptic gospels. I don't think that's true. No, some, and, will, some will even put it as pre-Pauline. Yeah, that's definitely not true. Uh, <laughs> not in any way. There's absolutely zilch and zero evidence for that. Uh, one of the ways that one of the ways that you date texts is you have to date them um, internally most most of the time. If you go to uh, uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, uh, I'm looking at the Charlesworth uh, edition here, um, and in in chapter three uh, of that text, uh, the author basically, you know unveils you know his what he's really concerned about and his social situation and what he's concerned about is um uh, i'll just uh uh read a, a couple of lines of this he says there will be many wicked elders and shepherds who will wrong their sheep and many will exchange the glory of the robes of the saints for the robes of those who love money and there'll be respective persons and lovers of glory in those days and uh, among the shepherds and the elders, there'll be hatred toward each other and great jealousy and so on and so forth. Much contention. And these shepherds and elders are specifically, as he says, the people who have abandoned the teaching of the 12 apostles. So they're, they're definitely they're Christian leaders and they will love office, the writer says. Now this is this is very fascinating because when you look at Christian history, okay, and and you and you do a real study of you, know, well, when did the the offices in the Christian Church emerge, like the official you know bishop and the official you know presbyter or elder and the official position of deacon? When when did these offices actually emerge in, in Christianity? And that's um, that's not until the second century, okay? So um, the poll does mention, uh, sometimes it's translated uh, bishops and deacons in, uh, in Philippians, but these aren't hard and fast offices. When you have hard and fast offices, that is a network of distinct roles, usually in hierarchical relationship, you're talking about the early second century at the earliest, okay? The letters of Ignatius are a good indication, good indication of this, that, that Ignatius is in the business of hammering out what the office of the Christian bishop is. And so are the pastorals uh, in, in First Timothy and Titus, which are all, which are both dated, at least my money, is on the mid-second century, okay? This is when Christianity really forms into this hierarchical network, okay? So if the author of the Ascension of Isaiah is talking about people who are, as he says, loving office and who have fallen away from the teaching of the 12 apostles and who love their position and love money, okay, he's, he's assuming that this is a time when, first of all, there are fairly well-established Christian offices, okay, like Bishop and Deacon, and that these are paid positions, okay? Now, this wasn't the case in the first century, all right? Why do these people love money is because they're paid as bishops, and they're paid as deacons, okay? So that is, he's showing you the situation, in other words, that he's dealing with, and it's not a first century situation, okay? It's a second century situation, and you can see that in the text itself. I don't have this, I, I don't have any other evidence than that. There's no other evidence here except internal evidence. So there you have it. Now, the tricky thing about the ascension of Isaiah is it's only preserved completely in Ethiopic, and not a whole lot of people read Ethiopic. Um, and, but people who do, thank God, have translated it for us. I, I personally don't know Ethiopic, we also have some Slavonic and Latin versions, okay? 
And interestingly, in the Slavonic and in, in Latin tradition, there's two different uh, manuscript sort of traditions. One very closely follows the Ethiopic, and the other uh, appears to be a shortened um, version. Okay. Now, it's often said, though, that the Ascension, the, the ascension of, the, of Isaiah is a doctored text or a highly doctored text. Well, not really. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's really not a whole lot of, a, a lot of evidence for, for doctoring, at least not any more than any other Christian text. Um, and, in other words, there's, when you look at the manuscripts, the Ethiopic tradition is, is extremely consistent, okay? And what helped, and we also have a Greek fragment which confirms that the Ethiopic is a good translation, okay? And we also have one side of the Latin and Slavonic tradition that also confirms that the, there are no problems in the Ethiopic, okay? So the, the idea of this being a heavily doctored text with people, you know, changing things and, and there being a lot of variation in the manuscripts, it's just not true. Okay, it's just not true. Now, the reason why some want to portray uh, the ascension of Isaiah as a highly uh, doctored and inconsistent text full of interp interpolations and errors is because there's some parts of the ascension of Isaiah that they don't like, okay? <laughs> and the way that they deal with passages that they don't like is not by facing them head on, but by claiming that they are interpolations, okay? And one of the claimed interpolations is chapter 11, where we have a full story of the birth of Jesus as a human being in a definite place and time, okay? I'll just read a couple lines from, from this just to get the flavor here. So this is again in the Charlesworth volume, Michael Knibb's translation, chapter 11, verse two, I saw a woman of the family of David, the prophet whose name was Mary. She was a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, a carpenter. Okay, very familiar story. This is obviously from the gospel of Matthew, okay? Okay, so this, this author, whoever he is, is dependent on the gospel of Matthew. He's, he's, he's using some of the exact same words, okay? He was of the seed and family of the righteous David of Bethlehem in Judea. And he came into his lot. And when she was betrothed, she was found to be pregnant. And Joseph the carpenter wished to divorce her. But he didn't reveal the matter to anyone. Okay, the matter to anyone. So this is straight up Matthew, okay? <laughs> you know, this, this isn't contemporary with the writing of Matthew. This is obviously dependent on the gospel according to Matthew. Okay, it's it's straight up Matthew. Now, when he goes on, he gives some, some variations that are very interesting, but this is absolutely part of the Ethiopic and uh, of, of, of the manuscripts of the, the Ascension of Isaiah. This is absolutely in there. There's no variation in the Ethiopic. It's all there, okay? Now, when you go to that one tradition in the Slavonic and, and the Latin version, there's a shortening of this text, okay? And one of the reasons that it's been shortened is it's because there's things later in this little vignette that weren't, were later taken not to be orthodox. And so this section was shortened. Now, some would claim that this section was chopped off, but it, no, it's not completely chopped off. It's still clear that Mary the Virgin of the line of David had a baby named Jesus, okay, even in the shortened version, okay, so that, that doesn't go away somehow, okay, it's just been shortened, okay. Now, so there's, there's no doctoring here, okay, that there's shortening, but no doctoring, and the, the person who's shortening also still believes that, um, <coughs> excuse me, also still believes that Jesus was physically born, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. But even, even if, and there's no reason to, 
But even if you decide that you, you don't like chapter 11 as data, okay, hmm. and you just want to kick it, kick it out of the book of, of the Ascension of Isaiah, um, you can go uh, and to an, an earlier section of, of the book, okay, which is um, um, back in chapter, chapter three, and you can have, again, uh, a section on the birth, mentioning the birth of Jesus and the uh, crucifixion, okay? So it's not as if, if you were to get, if, if you were to get rid of chapter 11, that all of a sudden the ascension of Isaiah would just be about, you know, Jesus descending into the region of the moon and being crucified in the sky by right. uh, sky, right. de sky demons, okay? Uh, that's, that's, just, that's just misinformation, okay? And, and this is really important. Um, whoever is, is writing the uh, Ascension of Isaiah is a, is a particular kind of Christian, but um, they aren't of a radically different, like they aren't a mythicist. Christian, um, they they believe in the they believe in the descension right. of of Christ from the seventh heaven and the ascension of Christ. <laughs> okay, um, and, and and frankly, all I mean, all Christians believe that. The, the, the difference between this author and, and other Christians is this author is just really extremely detailed, and he tells you what's in each of the individual heavens. Okay, and and that's why. This is a this is a fun story, but there's absolutely no doubt that this author really thinks that Jesus was crucified, and he wasn't crucified in in the sky. Uh, I'll read you again the section here that's um, that's relevant. Uh, this is chapter eleven, verse nineteen. After this, the adversary envied him and roused the children of Israel who didn't know who he was against him. And they handed him to the ruler and crucified him, and he descended to the angel in Sheol. In Jerusalem, indeed, I saw how they crucified him on a tree. Okay, now, <laughs> where's the sky demon hypothesis? I mean, the author says directly, in Jerusalem, I saw it. Okay, and, and this ain't no heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, this is right here on earth where the trees grow and where you have crucifixes. And as far as I know, there's no other parallel in Christian or any other literature of, of crucifixes and crosses being in the, in the sky or in outer space. And, and just as a side note here, <clears throat> it is anachronistic to refer to outer space and just slap it onto a, an ancient text, okay? And the reason is, is because outer space, our concept of outer space uh, when you look it up in the dictionary, it's a, it is a space that is, we, we view space now as sort of almost an, an infinite expansion out, out into nothingness of, of galaxies, untold numbers of galaxies, where there's just emptiness and void, okay? But that isn't at all how the ancients viewed heaven, okay? First of all, they don't, they didn't have no idea how big the heavens were how big the universe was, okay? But we didn't even know that until 1920, that, that it's sort of like, it, it, it's utterly beyond any human conception, okay? They viewed, as this author very clearly shows, very distinct levels. And, and there's, no, there's no outer emptiness, of airless, just void. Each level of heaven has occupants and there's air and there's stuff in the level of heavens and there's, people running around and people getting punished and people singing in choirs. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a highly populated <laughs> region, okay? So we, the ancients would never refer to that as it's like this infinite outer space with nothingness and void, nothing but, you know, stardust and comets. That's just, it, it, it's so foreign to how they would have would have thought. And, and this, this comment that Jesus comes from outer space, I don't know if it's, if it's meant to 
suggests that Jesus is some kind of alien being. I, I, I don't know, but that would be another level of anachronism because the, that's not, you know, the ancients never thought of little green men either or <laughs> that Jesus was one of them. So anyway, that I hope will lay to rest this very tired misinformation campaign about the ascension of Isaiah. To recap, it is second century texts don't depend on conservative datings from the likes of Richard Baucom or others who are very conservative scholars who want to put this very early. This author is clearly dependent on Matthew, clearly written after Matthew, clearly depending on a view of the church having distinct offices with paid positions in the second century. And there's nothing seriously wrong with the textual tradition of this document. It is an Ethiopic. And the other languages in which it was written, we don't have and the fragments confirm the Ethiopic is genuine. Okay. And that nothing really uh, in, in any way, uh, there was no huge campaign of doctoring and, and adding things. No, that, that's just not or taking away things. That's just not the case. So I'll, I'll lay that aside. Mephistus, who insist that Josephus didn't mention Jesus, argue that origin of Alexandria, who mentioned, is, is, is the first, is the earliest church that we know of that mentioned Josephus mentioning Jesus. And what they'll say is, is, is that he confused Jesus, son of Damnius, who appears at the end of the James story and is appointed high priest in the place of Ananus ben Ananus, um, because Ananus killed James and he was removed from power for having done that. And Jesus, son of Damnius, is put in power. So they claim that Jesus, son of Damnius, was the brother of that James and he was put in power as recompense for what happened to James. Right. Um, <clears throat> so that particular theory of uh, there's a, uh, I think there's only been one peer reviewed uh, article on that theory that came out in the Journal of Early Christian Studies in 2012, I think, uh, by Richard Carrier. And uh, I don't think that it has convinced. Um, <laughs> Any, uh, any scholar that I know of. Um, and the, the reason why it's not convincing is because, well, it, it's because the Jesus son of Damnius mentioned at the very end of the passage is introduced as, as a new character. And the Jesus who is called Christ, who is mentioned before the son of Damnius, is, is clearly a, a different character in the story. And there's nothing wrong with the manuscript tradition, okay, for Jesus who is called Christ. It's, it's in the manuscripts. Um, there's no problem with the manuscripts. Um, it's perfectly plausible that Josephus was aware of Christ. Any Roman in the year 93 on the streets of Rome would have been familiar with Christ, that there was this weird cult of people who worshiped this guy called Christ. That's not news anymore in the year 93, okay? So absolutely no problem with the textual tradition. And the connection of James and Jesus, who is called Christ, is so firm in the Christian tradition and confirms everything that Josephus says. That there's really no reason to doubt that there is a problem in the manuscripts. Now, Origen, interestingly, yeah, when he gets to this passage and, and, and Eusebius, you know, when, when they read Josephus, 
they're reading it with these Christian goggles on, and they're, they're mining Josephus in order to prove their Christian doctrines, okay? So, you know, they, Josephus, you know, tells you a, a bunch of things that led to the outbreak of the war, and this is one of them. And then what Origen and Eusebius do is they, they, uh, they make this relationship sort of more causal, and they want to say, well, the death of James actually caused the outbreak of the, of the Jewish war because it's God's wrath, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and, um, I mean, you could see, it's not a complete distortion, you could see with Christian goggles on how they could derive that from Josephus or make it seem like Josephus actually said that, that directly, but no, that's not that's not the case. Um, so obviously, Christian readings of this passage, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. But in terms of the passage itself, there's nothing seriously wrong here. And the tradition of James's martyrdom, okay, it does get mythicized. Absolutely, it gets mythicized. Okay. So absolutely, I would take Josephus over Hegesippus, you know, 100, you know, or 75 years later, okay? And there's stuff in the Nagamati library about how James dies, and, you know, that, that's how myths sort of, that's how something historical gets mythicized. The martyrdom becomes more and more right. glorious and grand, but the, the, the James isn't stoned. He, he falls from the top of the temple and he's beaten with a fuller's club. And you know, they, they really kind of soup it up, okay, by the second century. But that's not an indication that Josephus isn't telling the truth or that there's any kind of problem in this story. And James, I think it's safe, to, I think it's safe to say that in, in the year 62, which recall, you know, is, is only two years before 64. And by 64, we know that Romans could definitely identify Christians and distinguish them from Jews. And I think in Jerusalem, where Josephus was in, in 62, he could definitely tell who the sect of Christians were, the followers of Jesus. And we definitely know from Paul that James was one of the pillars. And so, and James also, according to tradition, is the is the brother of Christ. Okay, and that's you know that's very very early in the in the tradition. So there's nothing wrong with with Josephus' story, and Jesus, the son of Damnius, is is is, is introduced at the end of the story as a new character, and then simply dropped as uh, ultimately not really entirely important for the narrative as a whole. So I, I think it takes more mental gymnastics to try to, first of all, get rid of the reference to Jesus, the so-called Christ, okay? <laughs> nope, you don't need to get rid of that. And then to say that the Jesus son of Damius at the end of the passage, flip him up mm -hmm. and identify him with the Jesus who is the brother of James. I think that just, just takes a lot of mental gymnastics. And for any of those who want to read that peer reviewed article by Carrier, you should. It's a lengthy article and you see he has to bend over backwards and do all sorts of gymnastics with the text in order to make that even remotely convincing. But in the end, simplest is best. There's nothing wrong with the manuscripts. And Jesus, the so-called Christ, is most certainly a different character than Jesus, son of Damnius. The other thing that I've been thinking about is, is that if Origen confused these two different Jesuses, well, first off, the, the, the Jesus at the end of the story is called the son of Damnius. He's not even referred to as son of Joseph. And second, isn't he alive in the 8060s? So what, what's going on with Origen? Um, does he think that Jesus somehow uh, is he is he if if, or, if origin did confuse us to Jesus together? I thought of well, I guess for that to work, you would have to throw in there that oh maybe he confused a resurrected Jesus with him. It, it's just I can I can I can understand why one would say he he has to do a lot of mental gymnastics. Um, 
that's how I feel when I look at it. I'm like his fa- the fa- the name of the father of that particular Jesus is a completely different name anyway, and he's living thirty years later. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I would imagine Origen would have known that when he read the context of that passage. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I think Origen is is actually a good reader of Josephus overall. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's 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 like well, to make it work, you would have to either believe he rose from the dead, but Christians didn't think he came back yet at the time. A- anyway, that's number one. Number two, uh, I guess he. I guess if those that believe in the swoon theory could try to uh, mold that in. Again, it's 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 kind of strange how it comes out when you try to make that work. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I I have to agree. I think I think it. I th- I think Josephus most likely mentioned the character, the Jesus and James. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think again that's perfectly plausible. I, I think Josephus, by his time, was doing his readers a service by helping to explain some of the characters who were important for the early Christian movement. By the mid-90s in Rome, early Christians are becoming a presence. And they are certain it's been 30 years since they've been firmly distinguished from Jews in the city. And the Romans, you know, come across them. And I think that there was uh, enough interest to learn about them. And that's shown by 10 year, 10, 20 years later by Suetonius and Tacitus, who both in an aside, tell their Roman readers how this early Christian movement arose and who this priestess was and uh, how this got started. Because there's enough interest in, in Rome at the time. And Josephus, I don't think, has any real interest in Christianity, but I think he owes it as a service to his readers for introducing these characters who are like Jesus and James, who then became important for the development of the movement that was already in Rome. Well, thank you for joining me once again, Dr. Litwa. And at some point, um, whenever uh, your schedule is free, I would like to have you return. Yes, that'd be great. Yeah, I really enjoy these sessions, and I hope that they are informative to your audience. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.